This example is from the text Conceptual Dynamics. Specifically, this is review problem 7-16. The problem statement reads, a 12 ounce collar travels along a smooth curved shaft with radius r equals 1.2 feet. It starts from rest at position A and travels down the shaft until it encounters a spring with spring constant 11 pounds per foot. Determine the maximum compression of the spring and the normal force exerted on the collar at position B. Neglect the size of the collar. So reading the problem, we attempt to identify what's given. We're told the weight of the collar is 12 ounces, which since there are 16 ounces and one pound, corresponds to 0.75 pounds. We're told that the shaft is smooth. And so that is another way of saying that we can ignore friction or that friction is negligible. We're given the dimensions of the shaft. We're told that it starts from rest at position A. We're told the spring constant. And we want to determine the maximum compression of the spring, delta x, and the normal force of the collar at position B when theta is 45 degrees. Another piece of information that is implied is that when the collar compresses the spring to its maximum distance, it will return to rest. And so we can say at point C, the velocity is also zero. So now that we've read the problem, we understand what's happening, we've identified what we're told and what we're trying to find, we can go ahead and attempt to perform a solution. I've recopied some of the information that we've identified for the first part of the problem, finding delta x, finding the compression of the spring. We'll find the normal force in the next part of the problem. So when we do this, it's always good to draw a picture. So we have this picture to sort of understand what's happening. We should also draw a free body diagram of the collar. And so as the collar slides, the forces will change and their directions will change. Um, so I'm going to pick sort of an arbitrary position, let's say point B for the collar and identify the forces acting on the collar. One is its weight, which acts straight down. Two is the normal force, which is perpendicular to the, to the shaft, normal to the shaft. And then that's it. There are no friction forces, so there are no forces sort of along the shaft. In looking at this problem, we want to try and determine the, the type of kinetic analysis approach we should employ. And so one thing that we see is we're trying to find a compression. Um, so that can be thought of as the energy stored in the spring or related to the energy stored in the spring. And we see that uh, these forces act over a distance which gives some indication that this might be well suited to a work energy approach. The other things that we see that, that really make work energy very, very helpful is one, um, the fact that this normal force is always perpendicular to the direction of motion means that the normal force never does any work. And so if we use a work energy approach, we don't have to consider that force at all. And so that's nice because that, that's a challenging force to to uh, determine the value of throughout the entire path of the, of the object. The other nice thing is that since the normal force doesn't do work and the weight force is conservative, we can assume that, that energy is conserved. When we have a situation where energy is conserved, um, we can solve the problem by considering only the two endpoints. So the starting state of the system and the ending state of the system. We don't need to consider what happens in between. So these are all sort of pointing to the fact that a work energy approach would be well suited to this problem. And particularly since energy is conserved, we have that the total energy of the system, the energy at point A, 
um, where it starts, kinetic end potential is equal to the energy of the system at point C when the spring reaches its maximum deformation. Since the collar initially is at rest and finishes at rest, the kinetic energy at A and C is both zero. At point A, the potential energy is entirely you know, gravitational, and at point C, the potential energy is entirely elastic. And so specifically, I'm going to define my datum to be at point C. You know, that is the point from which um, we measure the height of the collar. Um, that is the point at which the gravitational potential energy of the collar is defined to be zero. So specifically, at state A, the spring is completely relaxed, so there's no energy stored in the spring. The collar is above the datum, so it has some potential energy, gravitational potential energy, which is equal to its weight, mg, times its height above the datum. And then at point C, the collar is at its datum, so its gravitational potential energy is zero, but the spring is compressed, so there is elastic potential energy, which is calculated as 1 half k delta x squared where delta x is the amount that the spring is deformed from its relaxed position. Ultimately, we're trying to solve for delta x. We know that the height is 2 times the radius, so this is a perfect semicircle. And so um, you know, basically, uh, point A is directly above uh, this lower point, so the diameter of the circle is the height of the collar initially at point A. We can solve for the compression. So I have the weight times 2R. You can multiply through by the 2, divide through by the K, and then take the square root of both sides. I plug in numbers. So the 2 times the 2 is 4. The weight is 12 ounces which, as I said before, is 0.75 pounds. The radius is 1.2 feet. The spring constant is 11 pounds per foot. The pounds cancel. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So these feet will multiply, and I'll get feet squared. When I take the square root, it'll become feet. I multiply this out, punch it into my calculator, and I get that the compression of the spring at point C is approximately 0.572 feet. So that completes the first thing that we're asked for. Moving to the next slide, I've again recopied what we've been given identified what we want to find. And so in this portion of the problem, we want to find the force acting on the collar at a particular instant. Whereas in the previous problem, we were sort of looking at the effect of the forces over, over a distance, over the entire travel of the collar. In this case, we really want to know what the force is at a particular instant. And that gives us some indication that we would like to use Newton's second law. Because Newton's second law gives us forces at a particular instant. And so recopying our free body diagram, you know, we have the normal force that's perpendicular to the shaft. And we have the weight that's straight down. And so looking at this, um, we need to find the acceleration of the particle of the collar in order to find the forces. And so we need to pick a coordinate frame to use. Since we have a collar moving along a path that we, that we know, um, that's some indication that a normal tangential coordinate system would be, would be good to use. Where our normal axis is pointed towards the center of the curve, our tangent axis 
is tangent to the curve in the direction of motion. And so if we do that, we can split this up, do the sum of the forces in the normal direction. The only force in the normal direction is NB. The weight has a component in the normal direction. So this angle here is theta. That means that that is also theta. And so we can split this up into a normal component and a tangential component of weight. And particularly, the weight is adjacent to that angle. So we'll use cosine. And it's in the opposite direction of the normal force. So it's in the negative normal direction. So we subtract w cosine theta. And that's equal to the mass times the normal component of acceleration. And so looking at this, um, we want to find the normal force. We know the weight. We know theta. We know the mass. We don't know the normal component of the acceleration. But we do know that the normal component of the acceleration is equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature rho. And this velocity we can find using a work energy approach similar to what we did in part A of the problem. So we'll use work energy to find the velocity at point B. And sort of the same reasons that work energy was nice to use in part A is similar to why it's nice to use in part B. Um, we don't have to consider what the normal force is doing. It does no work. Um, we don't have to consider what's happening over the entire path of the collar. We only have to consider what's happening at, at point A and point B because uh, energy is conserved. Um, and then furthermore, work energy gives us the velocity of the of the collar directly. We don't have to use any kinematic relationships. So again, energy is conserved. We have the energy of the collar at point A. It equals the energy of the collar at point B, where we consider the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy. The kinetic energy at state A is 0 because the collar is initially at rest. The potential energy, gravitational potential energy at point A is mg2r because that is the height of the particle above the datum, the same as it was in the previous problem. The kinetic energy at point B is 1 half mv squared. And then the gravitational potential energy is mg times the height at this point. Call this hb. There is no elastic potential energy because the spring is, is relaxed the whole time. We can find this height doing a little geometry. Specifically, we can create a right triangle here where the hypotenuse of the triangle is the radius r. This side of the triangle is adjacent to the angle theta. So we can use cosine. That side is equal to r cosine theta. And so that means that this height is the total radius subtracting that distance. And what's left over is hb. So it's the radius minus r cosine theta. We can go ahead and solve for v. So on the left-hand side, I have this 2mgr. When I distribute this mg across these two terms, I'll have an mgr, which when I move it to the left-hand side, I'll subtract. This other term, when I distribute the mgr, it's negative, but I'll add it to the left-hand side. It'll become positive. Then I multiply through by 2, divide through by m. So we'll say that's vb squared. The masses cancel. These two terms subtract 
So I'll have 2GR minus GR will leave me with 1GR. The GR that's common to everything can factor out. So I'll have the 2 out front. I'll factor out a GR. I'll be left with 1 here. I'll be left with cosine theta there. And then to get rid of the square root, to get rid of the squared, I'll take the square root of both sides. So I have 2 times the constant g, which is 32.2 feet per second squared. The radius, 1.2 feet. Multiplying the quantity 1 plus cosine 45. I punch that into my calculator, and I get that the velocity at point B is approximately 11.5 feet per second. So I have feet times feet, feet squared over seconds squared. When I take the square root, I'm left with feet over seconds. Once I have that velocity, I can then go ahead and solve for the normal force from this equation above. Call that 1. So from equation 1, I have that the normal force is equal to W cosine theta plus m db squared over rho. Plugging in numbers, the weight is 0.75 pounds. When I convert it, I have cosine 45 degrees plus the mass, which is 0.75 pounds, divided by the constant g, 32.2 feet per second squared. The velocity is approximately 11.5 feet per second. I square that quantity. I divide by the radius of curvature, which is 1.2 feet. So here I have foot times foot squared cancels with the foot squared. The second squared cancels with that second squared, and I'll just be left with pounds. I punch that into my calculator, and that works out to be approximately 3.09 pounds. So that brings us to the conclusion of this example.